Hello, everybody. I'm Tommy DeVisa. Welcome to the Nonprofit Executive Leadership Roundtables. Uh, we've been doing this now, Christine Deska and I, along with Frank and, and some of the folks, Frank Orzo from Nonprofit Sector Strategies and some of the folks from my team at the Vanguard Insurance Agency for over two years now. And as most things, we used to do this in person, you know, where we'd have 20, 25, 30 people at a boardroom table. I think the first meeting we had six and then I couldn't have it at my office anymore because the conference room was too small. <clears throat> and then we sort of became like nomads, traveling around Long Island to different organizations to utilize uh, their conference rooms. And obviously like the rest of the world, we are now virtual. Um, and somebody told me yesterday, I said, you know, my, my kid's school is gonna be closed. And somebody corrected me and I'm trying to remember who it was, but said, no, no, the schools are not closed, we're virtual. So business is not closed, nonprofits are not closed, programming is not closed, we're all virtual. So I see there's great efficiency in being virtual. I know there's people that are here today that would not be here if we were somewhere on Long Island in Melville. So I just appreciate that opportunity as well that we have all these great new folks and new connections to become part of this community. Uh, what we'll do is, as I say, what I'd like, I said earlier, I'd like to go around the room now. Here's, let me give you kind of a run of show how I see what's gonna happen this morning. We'll go around, we'll have each person introduce themselves quickly just to name the organization. Um, and then what we'll do is I will introduce both Christine Deska, who will be running our interview, and our guest of honor today, Barbara Paxton from Governance Matters USA. And at that point, Christine will conduct an interview. Barbara and Christine will have um, sort of a back and forth, really getting to understand what it is Barbara can provide around the topics of attracting or retaining board members. And usually during that, it becomes conversational. So you'll have opportunities to ask your own individual questions and then there'll also be a formal, if you call it, Q&A at the end of that conversation. So before I get started, I will just ask, does anybody have any questions? Perfect, thank you. So what I'd like to do is I, if you can stay in the, in the Zoom little box where you are, try not to move around because then I forget who I, who I didn't get to introduce themselves. But what I'm gonna do is we're gonna work it like this. There's actually a, a 631 number, so I don't know who that is, but I'm gonna, that's the first box. So I'm gonna say that number, and then what I'll do is, it's gonna work like this. The number that ends in 2510, and then I'll say, and after that, John DiBiase, and then I'll say John DiBiase, and after that, Courtney Bevis. So you'll have some time, so you'll know you're up next, so it's not going to be too abrupt. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to try to make it as brief as possible, but really let us know who you are. So uh, that phone number that I mentioned, Ends in 2510, followed by John DiBiase. Please, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, it's Amy Fleischer. I'm the direct um, development officer over at Long Island Select Healthcare. We're a federally qualified health center that treats um, the underserved. We turn no one away. Perfectly done, Amy. Great timing. John DiBiase, followed by Courtney Bevis. Hi, John DiBiase, uh, the former executive director of Anabic, retired last year. I tell people I am retired but available. Thank you, John. Courtney, followed by Margaret McPherson. Hi, I'm Courtney Beavis. I'm the Executive Director of Patchogue Medford Youth Community Services. We're a local nonprofit serving families in Patchogue and Medford in Suffolk County. Thank you, Courtney. Margaret, before you go, I want to say one thing. Folks, what I'd ask you to listen for is it, when you hear what somebody's doing, is there possible synergies from what they mentioned their firm, their organization does to what you do? And think about that. Jot a note down. And after the fact, you can always follow up with Christine or I to get that information uh, if you didn't connect with that person here today. So Margaret, followed by Tammy Severino, please. Hi, Margaret McPherson. I'm with Queen Centers for Progress. I'm on the board of directors and we serve individuals with developmental disability. Thank you. Tammy Severino, followed by Nina Scherer. Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> not enough coffee yet. I'm Tammy Severino. I am with RPC Development. It's a boutique consulting firm for nonprofits. And I serve on the boards of the Michael Magro Foundation, Girl Scouts of Suffolk County, and Silver Hearts Animal Sanctuary. Thank you, Tammy. But Nina, before you go, folks, if you could do me a favor, if you're not speaking, just go on mute because there's a bit of feedback that we get when, uh, when that happens. But Nina, followed by Christy Hawkins. Hi, I'm Nina Scherer. I work with Healing Haven Animal Foundation and we do funding for urgent veterinary care. Thank you, Christy. And then Christine O'Malley. 
Hi, I'm Christy Hawkins. I'm uh, the program director for Blue Umbrella Experience. We're a new nonprofit on Long Island servicing young adults with IDD through virtual classes and in-person social experiences, um, just to try to give them a place to belong and connect, um, particularly during this time. Perfect. Christine O'Malley, before you go, Christy, quick question, because I'm curious. I was looking at your website this morning. I was actually just talking to Christine about you. How did you find out about our group? Because I'm just so, so uh, excited that you did. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful. I hope you don't mind. I'm here. Um, I, Michael from uh, Spirit of Huntington. Oh, my we're, God. Yeah, we're, we've got, yeah. Yeah. Got to work closely with him to, to really keep going. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad he forwarded. Absolutely. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Christine O'Malley and then Tom Chifo, please. Good morning. I'm Christine O'Malley. I'm president of the Islip Arts Council, the board president. Uh, we work on getting wonderful cultural things all throughout Long Island, and we also manage the Islip Art Museum for the town of Islip. Perfect timing. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Tom, followed by Genevieve Sapp. Tom, just uh, you're on mute, Tom. Sorry. There you go. You're good now. Good morning. Uh, I'm on the board of directors for Camp Aquatic, a uh, summer camp and respite camp for special needs children. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for being here. Genevieve and then my friend, Danette O'Connell. Good morning, everyone. My name is Genevieve Sapp, and I'm a manager with your part-time controller. Your part-time controller is accounting services that serves various types of nation, um, excuse me, nonprofits nationwide. We build better accounting departments so our clients can build a better world. Thank you. Thanks, Genevieve. Thanks for being here. Danette and then Matt Thompson, please. Hi, my name is Danette O'Connell with Triumph International Consulting, where we offer growth operation and financial consulting to nonprofits. I'm also the president of Nonprofit Resource Hub, where we provide resources, education, and connect members to the nonprofit community. And we are um, encouraging all nonprofits to join the Nonprofit Resource Hub, which Tommy, Christina, and Frank are board members. So if you could go to www.nonprofitresourcehub.org, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Danette, and thank you for sharing that. And Danette, if you wouldn't mind, can you put the website in the uh, chat box for us so everybody can see that? Sure. Um, and we're, we're excited about the work we're doing with the, non, uh, the Nonprofit Resource Hub. It's been uh, sort of a labor of love for about the last year and uh, super excited to be that resource for the sector. So thanks, Danette, and thanks for being here. So Matt Thompson and then Adam Rabinovich, please. Uh, Matt Thompson, I'm the board chair for the American Red Cross in Long Island. I sit on the advisory board for TSI New York. I sit on the capital campaign for Girls Inc. of Long Island, and I'm an associate member of the Nonprofit Resource Hub, and if all goes well, I'll be joining another board probably this evening, and in my spare time, I work at Morgan Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> very good, Matt. Uh, I, I thought you were reading my resume for a second. You sound very similar. Uh, <laughs> um, so Adam, followed by Sandra Wolkoff, please. Hi, good morning. Adam Rabinovich speaking from the car, forgive the noise. I'm the executive director of COPE, supporting parents and families living with the loss of a child, uh, joined by Sandra, who will speak next. I'm also the board chair of Brick by Brick, improving education, economic development, and healthcare in East Africa. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. I, I love nonprofit people. Um, Sandra, followed by Melissa Greenberger, please. I don't know how that worked out with me and Adam being back to back. Right next to each other, right? No, next to each other. Funny. Uh, I'm Sandy Wolkoff. I'm board president of the COPE Foundation. As he said, a grief and healing organization, parents who've lost a child. I'm also a COPE parent who has lost a child. And I am in the position of looking for new board members. So your email came to me. I have no idea why, but I'm very happy to be it here. It was meant to be there. It was meant to land in your inbox. So that's, uh, that's, that's what we're here to discuss today. So perfect. Thanks for, thanks for pointing it out. And thanks for being here, Sandy. Appreciate you. Uh, Melissa, followed by Susan Samaru. Susan, I haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you. Melissa and then Susan. Melissa, we're on, I think you're on mute, Melissa. It doesn't say that, but I don't hear you. All right, we'll try to work out that behind the scenes, but I will just say, Melissa is a friend of ours with Pro Bono Partnership. 
that offers pro bono legal services to Long Island based nonprofit organizations. So if I missed anything, put it in the chat for me, Melissa, but cool. Pro bono means inexpensive, I believe. Um, so <laughs> Susan, followed by Milda DeVoe. Uh, good morning, uh, Susan Samaru, the executive director for the Moore Foundation. We are a breast health education organization focused primarily in providing education to high school students throughout Long Island and the five boroughs. We also provide uh, our breast health programs to the community groups and corporate uh, settings. Thank you, Susan. And the timing is going great, Frank Orzo. Wouldn't you agree? You're on mute. <laughs> okay, thumbs up. Thank you. Milda DeVoe and then Linda Moran. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thanks. Hi, Tommy. Um, this is Milda Hi, and you. I am the founding director of Pen Parentis and we're an arts nonprofit, a literary nonprofit that helps writers stay creative after they have kids. Now it's like a vital thing. <laughs> so. <laughs> so awesome. And we haven't seen each other in so no, long. It's so good to see you. <laughs> It's so cool to see you. At least see. We, can, we can't be too close, but this is perfect. All right. Linda Moran and then Lauren Marzo. Hi, I'm Linda Moran. I'm the executive director of the Islip Arts Council. And uh, you heard from Chris O'Malley. We actually present programs and cultural arts in all forms of the arts and manage the Islip Art Museum. And thank you for including us today. Well, thank you for being here. Lauren, followed by Jamee. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lauren Marzo, Chief Development Officer of the Viscardi Center in Albertson. We provide education, employment, and empowerment services for people with all types of disabilities and all ages. And happy to be here. I love working with Tommy, Christine, and Frank. <laughs> we love working with you. This is so awesome. I, I get giddy because I'm looking at all my friends on, on the screen right now. It gets me very excited. Jamee, you're included certainly in that. So Jamee, then Susan Cuccio, please. Hi, good to see everyone as well. Um, I'm Jamee. I am the Fund Development Director for Tigerman. We are schools and community services for children and adults with developmental disabilities and autism spectrum disorders. I'm done. Perfect. I, you're, you're perfect. What happened is I'm off of my screen. I got to get to the next screen. So Susan followed by everything went out of order when I changed screens. Uh, Susan, followed by Marilyn Tickton, please. Good morning, I'm Susan Quochu. I'm the president of the Anchor Program Fund, which is the nonprofit that provides uh, finance and services to Camp Anchor, Town of Hempstead, Camp Anchor, Special Needs Camp. Perfect, well done. Marilyn, followed by Jerry Wade. Uh, good morning, everybody. Marilyn Tickton, Court Furniture. We work with nonprofits. We have office and residential furniture at 50 to 75 percent off and we want to support your mission um, and partner with you if you need any furniture thank you very much thank you marilyn and you work with a number of nonprofit organizations Correct. right 250 Correct. nationwide um i do all of new york we have trucks and we deliver and set up Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Jerry Wade and then Mary. Good morning, Wade. everybody. Jerry Wade on Point Strategic Planning. I am a chartered special needs consultant or in easier terms, a special needs planner. So I work with families that have individuals with this in the IDD space. I currently sit on the board of directors for the Central Jersey Board for Junior Achievement. And actually tomorrow I'm going out to Long Island to be in your area to talk to another not-for-profit that I've been asked to become a part of a board. Welcome. Jerry, glad to have you. Thanks for your friendship. Mary Lee and then Wendy Foff, please. Mary, just come off a of mute, Mary. Let me ask you to unmute. Sorry about that. I always there forget to unmute. It's all good. Okay, I own a, um, an IT services company and we provide managed services as well as anything to do with your technology. We've been in business for over 20 years and 95% of our clients have always been nonprofit organizations. So we really work closely with our clients and technology is always a challenge. And um, we've been working a lot with uh, organizations who's working remotely. So I'd love to uh, be able to help you guys. Thanks for being here, Mary. I appreciate you being here. 
Wendy, and then Jen Capeza, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. I am Wendy Path Gennaro, the Director of Development for Queen Centers for Progress. Uh, Margaret is our board president who spoke earlier, and we provide services for people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities in Queens County. Thanks, Wendy. So happy you're here. I was, I saw your note and I'm glad you made it. You. Um, Jen and, yeah, absolutely. Jen and then Betty Vresic, please. Good morning. Jen Capeza, I'm the Director of Development for LI Against Domestic Violence, and we provide comprehensive services for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. I will say this, regardless of what happens this winter, shutdown or otherwise, our hotline operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we will always be here. We've been here through this whole thing. Thank you, Jen, and incredible service you provide. So, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, Betty and then Andrew Hall after that, please. Betty, can you, can you come off of mute? Um, all right, um, if you want, I'll keep it moving and put, put it in, put, mention what you do in the chat for me. That would be great. I think you're frozen. So Andrew Hall, and next on my screen is Amy Fleischer, but Amy already spoke. So Andrew Hall, followed by Kylie McGrain. Hi, my name is Andrew Hall. I'm one of the founders of the Blue Umbrella Experience. I'm also a martial art instructor, uh, which runs the Inner Force program, which is a way to help students with learning differences, find their voice, exercise, and increase their confidence. Andrew, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I love how you're marrying that, that whole martial arts piece to what you're doing. So I look forward to connecting with you on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, then it's Kylie. Kylie, I saw you register. I was excited when I looked up your organization. I have two daughters. So I'll, I'm going to ask you to come off mute. And then Kylie and then Kira, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Kylie McGrain. I am the founder and executive director of A Moment of Magic Foundation. We um, take college students into pediatric hospitals to provide creative programming, usually dressed like characters, princesses, superheroes, you name it, we do it. So we are based in Manhattan, but we have about 23 chapters nationwide. Oh, awesome. I, I look forward to learning more about your organization. Uh, people are moving all around the screen, so I'm doing my best to, uh -huh. to make sure we hit everybody. So Kira and then Angela Trevano. Hi. Please. Good morning, everybody. I see um, some familiar faces. Hi, Tommy. It's so good to see everybody. Good to um, see you, man. A lot of familiar faces here. So I'm Kira Jensen. I am the Director of Development for Mercy Haven, and we do mental illness and homeless housing. That's it. Perfect. Super succinct. We can actually deliver our messages in such a small amount of time, so okay. I appreciate that. As a guy who rather is rather verbose at times, I could learn from you guys. So, so Angela, um, Alyssa, I don't know if you can come off. I saw a note in the chat, but uh, uh, Angela, and then I think we'll pass Alyssa and go to Michael Macaluso. Good morning, everybody. Angela Trevino. I am with a new foundation. We actually started right before the pandemic hit. Uh, it is called the Page Elizabeth Keeley Foundation. Um, we are raising awareness for AVM, um, and we're educating communities on this treatable disease, which is a ticking time bomb that affects all ages. And we're trying to establish early detection screening programs. And we've recently just partnered with a neurosurgeon named Dr. Beckles, who is now on board with our organization doing free screenings um, for this very treatable disease if it's caught early. Well, thank you for being here and we look forward to connecting going forward. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Michael Macaluso and then after that, I think I had everybody introduce themselves, but I'll ask you real quick after that if I missed anybody. So Michael, if you would uh, introduce yourself, please. Good morning, I'm Michael. I'm uh, the former president of um, the Board of Directors for the Queen Centers for Progress and a part of their uh, nominating committee for future leadership. Future leadership for the board. Correct. Wow. This might be a good meeting. Glad you're here. I'm here. <laughs> That's it. All right. So I uh, please raise your hand, come off mute, say, hey, Tommy D, you didn't let me introduce myself if uh, if I missed you. Okay. Hey, Tommy D. Oh, I, we got one. Betty's back. Betty, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Tommy D. Hey. Um, my name is Betty V because <laughs> no one knows how to pronounce my last name. <laughs> um, it's actually Birdcheck is how you pronounce it. 
Um, I've been in fundraising for the past 12 years as a professional fundraiser, and last year I started my own business um, called Enhanced Strategies to Help Nonprofits and Member-Focused Associations, Trade and Trade Associates, Trade and Professional Associations with a variety of different tasks and services. Um, my specialty is really corporate relations and um, events. So I am, that's kind of where my niche is. I've raised more than $2 million in event sponsorships and I absolutely love that space. But I can also do like annual giving and database management and all that stuff. So I'm Glad here to, to have you. Me. Glad to have you here. And just kind of a networking story. We met through my buddy Vic Rajan through video socials, right? Isn't that how we all got connected? So it's just always, and when, I, when you think about networking and especially as nonprofit organizations, peripherals wide. You don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know where those connections lie. So thanks for being here. So I think we hit on everybody. I think we did those introductions and I did it in the time I had allotted. So, so far we're moving right along. So now what I'd like to do is introduce first, um, I have a lot of uh, different things open here, so I'm sorry. I need 10 seconds. First, I'd like to introduce my friend, my, my compatriot in this project called the Nonprofit Executive Leadership Roundtables. Um, Christine's been doing an incredible job with interviewing this and, and there's a lot of things that I'm good at and there's other things I'm not so great at and Christine really fills in the gaps on, on the sides where I'm not so great. So let me read a quick bio. Christine Deska is a co-founder of Nonprofit Sector Strategies, a public benefit corporation dedicated to helping nonprofits maximize mission impact. NSS provides strategic planning and board management services to small and medium-sized nonprofits. NSS has also created Bell's Board, a board management software platform and mobile app that helps nonprofit boards to be more efficient. Christine brings more than a decade of in-depth experience working in and with nonprofit organizations, foundations, and the government. At the Columbus Citizens Foundation, Christine was the director of programs from 14, 2014 to 2016, and she was also at AARP from 06 to 2014. At AARP, she led initiatives around older adult hunger, financial security, and volunteer management, often serving as the media spokesperson, which is why she's incredible at interviewing our folks. Christine created several scalable models at AARP, including a successful member discount and engagement model. And currently, aside from her business and personal life, Christine sits on the board of Hunger Solutions New York, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the alleviation of hunger throughout New York State. So Christine will be conducting this interview shortly with our guest of honor, as I say, Barbara Paxton. So I'm going to go to my other screen and I'm going to kind of look at what I want to talk about Barbara. So Barbara Paxton is a pragmatic and creative nonprofit leader with experience in board leadership, board development, and governance, as well as fundraising and finance. She brings a goal-driven approach to her work that focuses on results and achieving excellence by managing projects that are organized and professional and also monitoring the bottom line. Barbara believes that every nonprofit deserves good management and governance, and she has a unique breadth of experience that enables her to see the big picture while drilling down to the nuts and bolts of any project. So Barbara has a long history in nonprofit leadership. She has several roles in development and major gifts in, New York, in and around New York City, as well as a six-year role as the executive director of the Children of Bellevue. It's this experience plus Barbara's role as Chief Program Officer currently of Governance Matters USA that brings us all together to discuss our topic of attracting and retaining board members for your nonprofit organization. With that, I'd like to now have Christine and Barbara begin the conversation. Christine, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Tommy. Welcome, everyone. It is so nice to see so many of, as Tommy said, this is just such a heartwarming gathering, I think, for many of us each month. And we miss being in person, but there are some advantages. I think we've had folks from Philadelphia coming on now and all around the tri-state area now that we can all be in our homes or offices around the country and connect. So, you know, we're committed to coming to you with subject matter experts. And we are so, so, so excited to have um, Barbara Paxton with us this morning. I literally jumped for joy when, when Tommy said her name and organization because um, with what we do in terms of providing board management services, we often go to Governance Matters. Um, and Barbara will talk a little bit more about what they do, but I, I don't know that we've ever met with an organization 
that hasn't said, if only I could get more of the right type of board member, if only I could find more of the right fit for our organization, and we need this or we need that, and it's always a struggle. And Barbara is going to give us so many great tips and strategies to really take our organizations in the right direction, where we all want to go to have that that board that is engaged, that is following through on the expectations set for them, all of those wonderful things. It is possible, right, Barbara? <laughs> It takes work, but yeah. <laughs> so before we jump into kind of the meat of this, can you tell us a little bit more about you, Barbara, and how you kind of found your way to Governance Matters? Um, and if you want to introduce a bit a bit more about the organization, if folks aren't aware of the great resources that you all have. Sure. Sure. Um, I, uh, well, so Governance Matters has been around since, in some form, since the 60s. It was founded as an organization called Volunteer Consulting Group that you might have heard of. Uh, basically by the Harvard Business School Alumni Association to help place their alumni on boards. And then it sort of grew to an organization that only did that. Um, Governance Matters uh, was then a separate organization. It was a membership organization founded in the 90s. And I was there from the beginning and I knew the people who founded it. So it was really around encouraging good governance practices at nonprofits. And the two organizations merged in sort of the mid 2000s. So with the idea being you want to place people on boards. Yes, but you'd like to place them on boards that are good and are functioning. And so the two pieces kind of melded together really well. I came to it because I've always been really interested in good governance. Um, and I also was a fundraiser. So uh, except for the executive director of an organization, no person is more reliant on their board than the director of development in the fundraising department. So uh, I saw a lot of dysfunction. I saw some good functioning. And then in around uh, 2014, when they were rewriting the nonprofit law, I got really interested in and involved in that. So uh, when my predecessor at this organization retired, I said, could I please have his job? And they said, yeah. So a little bit more about us. We merged with an organization called Charity Strong two years ago. So we have board matching platforms. That is, you can sign up as an organization to look for board members. Individuals sign up to be looking for board positions. Uh, we are merging those two platforms, Knockwood, on launching the first week of January. We will be called Board Strong. So, you know, please check out these sites. If you want to sign up for either of them now, you'll automatically be transferred to the new site. And then about three years ago, we were acquired by the New York Council of Nonprofits, Nikon, you may have heard of. So uh, that's a statewide membership organization that has tons of resources. If you want to go check out their website. So I can always bring in my colleagues to address other issues, other issues besides just board governance. So that's me. Thank you so much, Barbara. I mean, there's so many great resources out there. And I think going back to Danette's mention of the nonprofit resource hub, I think there's so much opportunity to connect to your sites, many of the resources you mentioned with that hub as well. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah where we can kind of get this in front of everyone. Um, actually, the board that I serve on Hunger Solutions, we recently went through Nikon to get some assistance with um, a project for our board. It really is a wonderful resource um, as well. So um, when Barbara and I were talking the other day, she said, you know, before trying to recruit new folks, make sure you have a functioning board first. And I kind of sat with that for a moment and I went, uh-oh. You know, I think that could be why a lot of people are coming on this morning because they want to have a functioning board or they, they are kind of going towards something and they're being aspirational about the board that they want to have. But Barbara made some really, really important points about sort of maybe before engaging in a recruitment effort, taking a look in the mirror and reflecting on, you know, what your organization has in place and going from there. So can you talk a little bit more about that, Barbara? What should an organization do first? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the, the main thing is, is you, you want not only to think about recruiting new board members, but retaining them. And in order to retain them, they have to have, you know, a positive experience. So it's not like your board has to be perfect. I mean, probably you're retaining, you, you're recruiting people to make changes in your culture in addition to just filling gaps of skills. But you do want to make sure that you've created some, uh, a board, that your board is a place where they can feel like they're making a difference almost immediately. So you want to take a look and think, 
you know, if your officers, if your board members have been in place for a very, very long time, how are you going to make these people feel welcome? But also think about how you're going to change that. Because most new, many new board members, people who join boards, they don't want to be just foot soldiers. They don't want to just sit in meetings. They want the opportunity to lead committees. They want the opportunity to be one of your officers, right? Especially for mid-level career people, uh, they are looking to really gain some leadership skills. Uh, that, you know, and then if you have committees, you want to make sure that they're functioning that they have a job description, that you know why you have the committees there. Um, because uh, obviously so many of us have, no, have committees because we know we need committees, but we don't really know what they're doing. And it's probably, and it's good to sort of really think through like, okay, what are we asking for our board members? What work are we giving them? Are we using them to the best of their ability? Are we communicating with them? And so that way, when you start to get new board members, you've thought, through what what is their what how do we include them how do we make sure that they're making an impact absolutely so you know going toward recruiting it sounds like this could sort of be a parallel effort if you're kind of assessing what you have in place but also looking to you know broaden your reach and bring in new folks um you know some organizations we certainly talk to you know where, ask, where do I start when looking to find the right board members for my organization? So I was wondering if you could share maybe some examples of, of recruiting that you've seen, recruiting strategies that you've seen work. Um, and also maybe talk a little bit more about, um, you mentioned this, you know, uh, it's, it's, I think what we call, and, I, and Matt Thompson, I think you've said this many times, right? The what's in it for me, you know, how are we looking through the perspective of a prospective board member and also making sure that, you know, they're gaining from their experience as well. And when we go to them, making our organization attractive for them to be part of as well. So maybe some stories could help all of us kind of think of how we could put strategies in action at our organizations. Sure. I mean, that was kind of a broad question. Let me see if, if I can think about how to come through it. I think uh, I think that a concerted strategy is really first off thinking about, you know, what are, what are the gaps? Who are you looking for? Um, and then really just uh, using your network, getting out there, using, th really thinking about um, once you've identified what you, the person or the skills or the, that you need, it's much easier to find people, right? If you have a target. So I should have mentioned before, you probably, you need a job description, you need it written down. You want to make sure that people, you know, when we recruit board members, sometimes we get desperate. We tend to minimize the amount of time that it takes and the amount of resources we hope they'll bring. So make sure that you're explicit about that. And then I think just strategies for recruiting. Obviously, I have a board matching site. Uh, there's other places that have board matching. Put it on Facebook, put it on LinkedIn and uh, talk about it. I mean, one of the issues for many of us is, is that there are people out there who would make great nonprofit board members who really want to give back, but we have a stereotypical idea of what is a great, what a person who serves on a nonprofit board looks like. So you want to widen, widen your, your reach and really talk up the organization and ask people. You know, you'd make a really good board member, would you consider doing this? I think um, some really, uh, I know, just, I'm trying to think of like a, a, some stories that involve, you know, I was uh, one board member I brought in, it was just, I met her, she was, uh, she works at a, a major university, right? And just an amazing person. And once I started to talk to her about you know, I thought that she would be really good. Her interest would be really good on a board. She was just like, kind of taken aback and surprised. Um, but she's actually just joined a board and it's great. And I think the, the other thing is, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about like diversity and, you know, people frequently know that their voices are missing in your space and they want to elevate it, that you can, you can bring that up, you can talk to them about that, as long as you have a place for them and a way for them to feel like integrated. Did that answer your question? 
There's a lot, we have a lot to cover and my question was pretty broad. I think just to zero in on a couple of really important things that you said, I think you mentioned there has to be a written job description. And I think that I, I've certainly seen this happen. Uh, I was just asked to recruit new board members where I serve. Um, I don't have anything in writing yet. Um, so it's been kind of informal. And I think that's something we can all work on because when you have that document, we've talked about the best practice of kind of managing expectations and setting clear expectations. So I just wanna make sure everyone's hearing how important that is because it really allows your organization to focus and the target, what you need. Um, so maybe you can say more about that. I think some organizations um, have not come together to really decide what, what are the specific needs for their board and who are those targets and how can everyone become engaged in finding the right members for the organization. Right. So you want to look, what you want to do is you want to analyze who is on our current board, right? You can do that by asking them, by doing survey. And then I think for every organization, it's different around what you need or what you can prioritize. But what I would suggest is you want to think about like, what do we want to accomplish in the next year or two? We used to say the next three years, three years now seems very, very far away. But what, are, what do you want to accomplish? Do you, are you thinking about buying a building? Well, you want to be laser focused on finding someone who knows something about the real estate market, right? And there are trade associations and there are chambers of commerce and I'm sure you all, you know, your connections, you want to do that. Uh, what if you are someone who has contracts and you know, risks around several people, several mentioned working with uh, people with disabilities, et cetera. Well, you need a lawyer on your board, right? To help figure, just in case something happens to spot risks to help you. So you can really say, okay, we need a lawyer and then think, do we need a generalist? Do we need a corporate litigator? Does it really matter? Oh wait, we're gonna buy a building. Maybe we should try and focus on finding an attorney that specializes in real estate. Um, so that's another thing. If you're looking at diversifying from, you know, racial, ethnic, age point of view, that's great. Those are gaps that you need to fill, but think through why you want to do that. Not just because we need bodies that reflect, but like, do we need a voice for our community? Do we need uh, a fresh, you know, younger people? Do we need real help with our social media and our technology and, and and that sort of thing. So it's bringing diverse voices into the room is a good end in itself. But if you can marry that with what your needs are, then all the better. That is so important. I think um, we all know that diversifying is the right path. We all know that we'll have better outcomes. With better outcomes, the more diverse our board is. But it sounds like you're saying, let's make sure we do that in a strategic way based on what our mission is and where we want to get to based on exactly. our organization's goals. So always backing into that. We talk about this a lot in strategic planning and I think you do too, Barbara. And it's hard to take that step, that take that breath sometimes and you know, look at what the goals are and then proceed right. forward in recruitment. Right. Um, so, though I should say what we also tell people is, you know, if you find someone who's really good, who's really interested in serving on your board, uh, you, you know, take them. Um, you don't have to say, well, they don't, they're not much the profile of what, what, what we're supposed to be looking for. Passion can trump. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, this is a good segue though into managing expectations though, right? So say you go a little bit off course from your job description because you find this dynamic individual who you know can bring value to your organization. Um, what's the best way, and this kind of ties into what we talked about with onboarding, I think, as well. And the, you mentioned just how important onboarding is when we talked the other day. Um, what would you say is the best way to set clear expectations for a new board member? Um, and then talk a bit about the best practices around onboarding that we can all um, employ. Right. Well, that job description goes a long way towards setting expectations, I think. Um, but, and you know, also you have a nominating process, you have an interview process, so you wanna be really clear during that process uh, what, the, what the being on the board entails. You should, I think, put prospects together. Well, you should as board members be able to articulate why anybody would wanna serve on your board. 
right? And if you don't have a really good, you know, if it's a miserable slogging experience that, you know, we have, we do because we care about the cause, then you want to think a little bit about that. Because if people, the reasons that people serve on boards, really, let's just back up and think about that is first, they want to make a difference in their community. That's important. But also, they want, they want to meet people that they otherwise maybe wouldn't meet. They want to go to a board meeting with people that they like. So you want to make sure that your board, you know, is a, is a good group of people that, that, that they'll want to be part of, right? Um, onboarding is so critically important and so few organizations even think about it that I'm just really glad you asked me. Because if you haven't thought about how you're going to you have to think about how you're going to integrate new board members into the board and make them feel welcome and make them feel like they belong from like day one. It can be really, uh, especially if you have board members who've been on a long time, you can kind of overlook this step. But, you know, it's kind of like being on a board is kind of like, um, you know, your private club, right? If you join a private club, uh, Everybody there already knows each other. They've been together forever. They know where, you know, how things work. If you have been in a club before, if you're familiar with that environment, then you can kind of sit back and think, you know, well, I'll figure things out. But if you're going to be bringing people in who've never been on a board before, then they can feel like they don't know what they're doing and they're completely unwelcome. So we recommend sort of a buddy mentoring system uh, where the people who've been on the board a while uh, look after the people who've, um, who have just joined. Uh, we recommend that it be formal and structured. You don't want to just say, okay, Tommy, you've been on the board a while. You mentor Betty. Go for it, right? You want to you wanna say, okay, this is what we want. We want you to, you know, meet, call the person before a board meeting, call the person after a board meeting, take them out for coffee every once in a while um, so that they really, and so that they really feel like they belong. And then you, you just want to make sure that you include people as you go along in that, that they understand that they are part of the organization. That, that's such great advice. It goes a long way, you know, and most boards meet quarterly. So it's not like when you start a new job and you're with your colleagues daily, it's very easy, I think, for a board member to feel um, not necessarily unwelcome, but disconnected from the group if they don't have that onboarding at, at the onset of their service. Yep. Um, Tommy has told me that we have a question in the chat, and I should have said that. Um, you're not yep. virtual. Please, you know, type in the chat if you if something comes up and you want to ask, and we also do build in time at the end for questions um, as well. But either way, Tommy, take it away. Absolutely. So this question comes from Melissa Greenberger. So it's actually two different questions, Christine. So we'll, I'll tell you them and then if you can manage the, that. Um, one, the first one is, is Barbara aware of any organizations that provide training for potential board members so they can learn about roles and responsibilities of board members before joining a board? Um, maybe Governance Matters USA does stuff like that. So maybe that's the mm -hmm. answer there, um, but I'll let you answer that. And the second piece there is how about resources for hot topic here, diversity and inclusion training for boards. Obviously that's a big deal. We just did something uh, around DEI with the nonprofit resource hub uh, last month. So those are two questions, Christine, you got them? Got them. Cool, thank you. So post questions in the chat if you want folks and we'll address those, thank you. So uh, I do a free monthly training. You can find it on my website for people who are interested in joining boards. Uh, it's about an hour and a half. It starts out with, you know, who regulates you, what are the duties of loyalty, uh, obedience, and care. Um, and then I talk about, uh, so we talk about how boards should work, and then I talk a little bit, tell them a little bit about how they should think through finding a board, right? And in some ways, you know, you guys are welcome, people who are on boards are welcome to attend. Uh, used to be like 10 people, last week we had 40. So the Zoom thing is, is pretty cool. Um, but it helps, it, you know, if any of you were, wanted to join, it would also help you think through. We tell people, you know, think about what stage the organization is that you want to join. Do you want to join a grassroots organization and roll up your sleeves? Do you want to be more of an oversight board? Think about what you care about, arts, advocacy, et cetera. Um, and think about the culture of the organization. And that's something you all should think about as you're out there recruiting board members, you know, 
do you have a very formal process? Do you meet quarterly? Does the executive director, uh, is that really your point person? Do you encourage people to really get to know staff? to interact with them? Do you encourage them to, you know, stop by the office every once in a while and just find out what's going on? Every organization has a different culture. Um, so that's that. The DEI piece, there are, yeah, there's a lot of training out there. There are a lot of free resources out there and I can provide them. Um, I'll send them to Tommy and he can send them out to everybody. Uh, there's something called the Myers Spectrum. There's and there's we uh, Nikon has an assessment, which uh, if you're a member of Nikon, it's about five hundred dollars, and it is not only for boards but staff. So it's a board staff assessment and it tells you, like, where are you? Do you have the policies in place? Uh, are are you really ready to diversify? You know, very important, and I think it is worthwhile, sort of taking a look at your organization, at your board, and seeing where are we on the spectrum of, um, I don't really like the term wokeness, but, you know, so many, because there are income inequalities, because we are in some ways de facto segregated, there are many people who understand diversity from a theoretical point of view, but not really have, don't really have a lived experience of working with a a variety of, of you know, diversity of people. And so you want to really think, are people just saying that they're interested in this or are they really committed to it? And having someone to come in and train you or work with your board can really be worthwhile. Um, or you can try and do it yourself and I'll send you some of these resources. Absolutely. I, I, I talk a lot about how about, it was 10 or 12 years ago, um, AARP brought in an expert in unconscious bias to speak with our organization. And I've never, forgotten the things that I learned from the, that two day training. And I think those ki kinds of things, bringing that into your organization in conjunction with, you know, bringing on new board members can really kind of be a team building process as well as this opportunity to grow your board and engagement and your leadership team also. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to go to Jen's question here in the chat. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about. She says, um, what are some best practices to manage agency expectations of board members while recruiting and onboarding? For example, laying out what we expect of board members. So this goes back to the managing expectations piece. And Barbara, when we talked the other day, you gave a great example um, about how you know an organization brought on an, a, a member and then a, an event was coming up and there was this disconnect between that member sort of being expected to purchase a table or a sponsorship or something like that and then and the member not really being aware of that so i think what are some other ways we can and jen feel free to chime in if i'm not communicating your question um uh, accurately but what are some other ways we can really lay out the right expectations for our board members this happens a lot i think Right. Well, back to the beginning. First of all, your current board members have to be all on the same page about what the expectations are too, right? And you have to be really careful about are you setting different expectations for your new board members versus your old, your former board members, and how are you working that, right? Um, you know, and and it's perfectly fine to say someone has been a member of our board for twenty years. You know, they don't have to show up as media. You know, we just want to keep them there because they're part of our family. But you also, again, you don't want to establish two different kinds of boards, like the people who used to be on the board and who are now on the board, and that you're expecting more or different things of the, of the new people. So I think that's one thing. I think, you know, uh, back, to, back to your point, you know, we just really need to think through, like, what are our assumptions about people? Um, the, the case that, the, the example that I gave you there is, you know, a board recruited someone from one of the major banks and they have, and you know, they sort of said, what, in fact, my thing about not everybody knows what it means to be on a board or what the expectations are. So their expectation was that person would bring the bank to buy a table at the gala, right? And they didn't articulate it that to the board member who didn't actually have the kind of position where he could get bank to buy a table to the gala. So you want to you know, every, lay everything out. Um, what are our financial expectations? What are, what are the meeting expectations? What are the committee expectations? What other resources 
always, of course, telling them what you're going to do to support them, uh, especially around fundraising goals. Mm -hmm. You're not out there. You're not out there on your own. Or if you are out there, if your board members are out there on your on their own, think through that as well. <laughs> well this is a good segue. Mm -hmm. The next question that I have for you is, and this is something we talk about a lot. It, uh, we actually had a session way back where Matt Thompson, who's on today as a board chair, talked about this um, in building relationships, basically connecting board members, then you're going to get more out of your board members. But in terms of how to approach the give get with our board. Um, and when we talked the other day, I thought it was really interesting how you brought up that there's not a one size fits all for this. I think a lot of organizations are looking to define a dollar amount and go to their, their board and, and kind of um, present this to them. And then at the same time, there's a lot of organizations struggling with the old guard and then the new guard and transitioning from um, a board that did not participate in fundraising to a group that now is needed for fundraising. So bridging that gap. But what advice would you give to organizations about approaching becoming more of a fundraising board or talking about um, a give get for the board? Um, well, I think, um, yeah, I, I, first, first off, I think that the whole concept of give get is a bit being talked about and under the microscope these days. Uh, because especially organizations that have large give gets are realizing that that is a barrier to them having things of a diversity of skills they might need, right? If you're a school, you know, a teacher, a social worker, uh, a couple of people here mentioned, you know, behavioral health, um, a member of the community, for example, if you have a really high give get, none of those people can afford to be on your board. So you want to think about sort of uh, you want to think about that, whether you want the same number for everybody or it's a meaningful contribution. But that being said, um, you do want the way to, I think, approach fundraising and talking about fundraising this is, first of all, making sure that everybody knows that they need to make a meaningful contribution, really sitting down and saying, what can you, what, what are your means? What, what do you think you can bring? Understanding that no board member is going to commit to the maximum that they can really give if you're just meeting them for the first time and they've never heard of the organization, right? Um, I think in our experience, you know, if you sort of say, uh, you've never heard of this organization, they're really great and they expect $15,000 a year, you'll feel people pull back because that's a pretty big, big number. But the other thing is really, when, when I started out in fundraising, we said every single board member has to be able to solicit a gift and we would do all of these role playing and all of that. Um, and have come over time to realize that that just never works for some people. You can, they, they're not comfortable. So think about the role that this person can play and how you can support them. So they can be a cheerleader. They can attend events and talk you up. Maybe they have networks that they can connect you to. And then probably a third of them are perfectly happy to sit down with their friends and actually ask them for money. But there's the whole gamut of, of skill sets in there. That's really important, I think, kind of assessing your board, looking at how do different board members bring value in different ways. And there are many ways that we can look to our boards to do this. Um, can, I, can I also add, um, so with a give get, there tends to be tension and resentment around some people who are making it and some people who are not. And what we really see is the tension is around people who have similar means, but some of them aren't doing it. So as we think about diversifying our boards and bringing in younger people who can't give as much, et cetera, I mean, we're not finding that people who have significant means who are already writing big checks are resentful of the people who they recognize can't, right? It's where the resentment was, and I think probably many of you have experienced that, is people who are doing their part versus people who aren't doing their part. And that's where the tension comes in. Mm -hmm. All right, well, 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 we'll go, I think, more into that in a second. I want to get to a couple questions here in the chat. Um, Amy, thanks for your question. Amy asks, how do you handle it if, you're, if your board members are executives at other nonprofits and they don't want to give up any of their contacts for your events? Um, it's a, and then it says, because they want to make sure they donate to them and not lose the money to us. 
I think that is what it is. Um, I, I don't think that you can persuade them to, if they're responsible for fundraising for their own, own nonprofit. So you need to get a little creative with them and talk about, I mean, they're the board, they're responsible for the financial sustainability of your organization. So we think about board service as sort of shared accountability, right? It's not staff members trying to convince board members about what they should do. It's board members holding themselves collectively. I mean, obviously staff has to contribute, but you know, if your board isn't giving up its contacts and they're responsible for the financial sustainability of the organization, then they need to have a conversation amongst themselves about what are we doing here? And how are we financially sustaining this organization that we're responsible for if we're not raising money for it? Mm. And that's a good question. I mean, the answer could probably be maybe we should uh, have less people who are nonprofit executives and more people who aren't. Maybe we should restructure the way we think about our board. Um, mm -hmm. But if you have someone who's just like, no, nope, I can't give up my contacts because I'm on the, I run another organization, they're not going to. <laughs> you can't convince them to. And Jen commented on what you had said, Barbara. She said, I suppose the first best practice is to elevate the expectations of your current board members before bringing on new ones if you're trying to make some a sort of transition. And that can also help engage the current board in what the organization is looking to achieve with its board. Um, and everyone can kind of get involved. And then we, we do some uh, self-assessments sometimes where board members are able to kind of reflect on why did they initially join the board and are they still following through on what they intended to bring you know, to the organization. And it, it's kind of a, a more gentle way for board members to think about, are they still contributing in the way they, they initially um, you know, meant to when they joined, especially if it's you know, recurring uh, or ongoing terms and they've been on for many, many years. It's always a good thing to do. Yeah, I mean, we, this isn't a topic for recruiting and retention, but you really, the chair of the board should probably sit down with every board member every, every year, every other year and check in. How are you doing? What did you think you would achieve? All, you know, um, board development is not, and we've, it's not one thing. It's not one day we've recruited, you've done. Board development is ongoing all year. It's work. Mm -hmm. Never stops. <laughs> it never stops. Yes. <laughs> Kylie has a great question here. Um, going back, you know, uh, when it comes to detailing board positions, it can be intimidating to look at a blank screen. Is there a good place to start to spark ideas? So I think Kylie's asking for templates for board positions. I think this is something a lot of us um, would find helpful. Where would you recommend that, that folks look for those? Maybe Governance Matters? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe Governance Matters. Um, they'll be, yeah, they're not up on our, our, as I said, we're launching a new website in January. So our current website, while it has great, in, it's a little clunky, but uh, let's just make a note and I will send around a draft board description to you guys and you can send it around. Uh, you can use it or not use it. I think, um, that would be great, Barbara. And I think similarly with committees, you know, you did mention, and I think a lot of us have found this, we end up signing up for a committee when we first join the board, and then it becomes unclear what are what we're expected to do as committee members after some time goes by and sometimes they languish. And um, so maybe if there's a committee um, description as well, I think. Yeah, and, and there's, there's all, just Google it. Um, there's a, a couple of, um, I, I'm going to throw out a few competitors, Christine, I'm sorry, but uh, Boardable, for example, Board Effect are uh, companies that try to, that are, that have platforms for, for organizations to manage their boards better, like a, a board portal without having to build it into your own website. Um, and they all have sample job descriptions. Um, and resources. I think you board source. I'm sure you're all familiar with board source, and they have probably knew that uh, over years they sold you know booklets of uh, top ten this, top ten that. Uh, they are turning much more into a research organization, and so they've dropped the firewall. Not on all of their resources, but a lot of them. So check out board source as well. Great. 
And so you talked about how you have a monthly um, educational offering, it sounded like, to let board members know about their roles and responsibilities. Um, are there other ways you'd recommend that, you know, especially board members that have served for quite some time or just an organization looking to refresh their board members' minds on what it is they're responsible for as board members? Um, I, I know many of our partner companies hold educational forums and things of that nature, but is there kind of a way to standardize this practice so that your organization kind of feels like they have a plan in place for keeping board members informed? Um, yeah. Sure. Um, well, resources, especially for New York State, since most of us are, uh, is the New York Charities Bureau. They have a document called Right from the Start that details a lot of this. If you join, here's my plug, uh, the New York Council of Nonprofits, Nikon, it's a really relatively inexpensive uh, membership. They do pretty, we do regular webinars on this topic. And uh, not to plug myself, but I'll do it anyway. If you want a higher governance matters to come in uh, and train your entire board all at once and then have a, an open discussion around these topics, we do that as well. And Great. sometimes that can be easier to bring. As, as anyone on, who's a consultant on this call knows, it's sometimes more effective to bring in someone from the outside, even if the person from the outside is telling the board what you could otherwise have told them yourself. But since you work for them, they don't take it as seriously. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, let's see, we have a good question here. It just went down my screen a little bit. Uh, I think, okay, Jen, I think you were asking, so, and this is something, it's, it's um, slightly, maybe off topic, but very related. How would you recommend starting a conversation with a board member who's been around for 20 years and maybe has lost their initial passion, fire, ambition for the organization? How do you approach them to kind of re-engage? Um, or what, what, what conversations would you recommend starting with that kind of board member, especially as you're looking to grow your board? Yeah. So first of all, we recommend that that conversation happen with the chair or another board member, that it's that peer-to-peer -peer self accountability aspect is really important. You don't want a staff member telling a board member they're not doing their job. It's just not as effective. Um, so that, that's one thing. The other thing is as you have this conversation about what do we expect from our board, right? You don't, you can frame it in, okay, well, you haven't been to this many meetings. You haven't been, I think, you know, it can be, I think many people stay on boards that they're not very engaged in because they feel guilty. They feel like they should be there. They feel like they, you know, it's hard to quit. And, you know, so sort of having the conversation where you let them know it, it, it's okay to go to another role, that can be a relief for everybody. The other recommendation, the other suggestion that I, I would have is if you have emeritus board members or people who've been on for a long time, create an advisory board, create mm -hmm. an emeritus board. Uh, so you're not kicking them out of your, and it's good if you have term limits to do something like that too and wanna, wanna you know, so that once a year they are invited to a meeting where you brief them on what's going on, you continue to get their support, especially if they write, you know, if they support you in other ways, they have good connections that you could use, et cetera. So you can just very much approach it and, in, in, you know, uh, we see that it's hard for you to come to all of our meetings. You're not really on a committee. We've created this, you know, more prestigious or a prestigious um, uh, board, you know, advisory board, emeritus board, et cetera, that we would really like you to take part in. Um, That's a great suggestion. I think that that helps a lot of organizations who have this cohort of members who they're looking for, they're looking to transition to something different, but they still want to keep them engaged. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about what, um, what expectations you would set for an advisory board? Um, so if organizations are thinking about starting that, how, what's, what are the best ways to do that? Right. Um, so the great thing about like junior boards, advisory boards, emeritus boards is there is no job description. You can make it what you want and what you need from it. You have your governing board. There's definitely like you have the duties of you have your fiduciary responsibilities. You have your financial responsibilities. Uh, those things you can create yourself. I mean, I think the the what you want to avoid is having uh, 
an advisory board that's just on your letterhead and doesn't exist in real life uh, because that um, that really just just people will dissipate. But I've worked with organizations where they have a meeting twice a year of their advisory board. I've uh, worked with those that the advisory board doesn't meet, but the advisors are you know expected to get actually be on tap and give advice every once in a while. It, but that's and that's more of the work part of making sure that you, sustain your board, right, is you have to actually call them, reach out to them a couple of times a year and make sure that they feel like they're involved. Um, on the other hand, you could create something that really does do a lot of work. Tell if you have a lot of uh, expertise among your advisory board or like you're about to have a 60th anniversary or something, you can give them a project to work on if you com it's composed of the kind of people who would like to do that. Same That's thing great. with junior boards, by the way. Uh, we haven't really talked about those, but those you can create your own as well if you want a junior board that's helping do volunteer projects with your clients or is doing like small fundraisers. Uh, you, you can create what those people, just make it sure, make sure with both of those groups that you're taking into account what they want to do and not just what you want them to do for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for mentioning junior boards. I think that's something that organizations I know about, but a lot have not um, gone down that road. And it really is a great way to kind of, this might not be the best word, test out. <laughs> yeah. Oops, right? Um, you want to say more about that, especially when it comes to diversifying with regard to generational um, and age. Um, and as many of our boards are growing older and we are looking for new folks in, in a variety of areas. Yeah. Um, so you, you just mentioned two kind of different things, which is using the junior board as a way to recruit new board members. And you could use your committees to do that and well. And then what is the role of a junior board? I think that if your board members, um, if, if you, your view of attracting new board members is you want people who volunteered for your organization, who've been involved in your organization and have a certain seniority with the, and, and that's not working for you, then you should rethink that. Uh, because I don't think that anybody in their 20s or 30s, for example, is necessarily doesn't belong on your board. Uh, those people have great ideas, great energy. Um, and uh, like I said, know a lot more about social media and things like that than most of us. Also, you know, people, people who've grown up in the last couple, you know, post 1980, uh, fundraising board service volunteering is very much part of what of their, their lives, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, then you asked about sort of, so junior boards also can serve as a way for people to show commitment though. And I think that, again, you, you want, if, if you are thinking of it as training for your big board the, or your governing board, you might think about setting it up in such a way that staff doesn't run the committee, that they have their own little board of like a president of the junior board and some officers, et cetera. So you give the members also an opportunity to get some leadership experience and demonstrate leadership. Um, and if you do it like that, you can justify, I don't want to know, use the word justify, but sometimes you, you want a junior board, but then you sort of look at the amount of staff time that it takes to support it. And it doesn't look like it has a serious return on in investment, right? If they, they're doing like, I don't know, shopping, fun, well, we don't do those anymore. You know, when we get out like little fundraisers, cocktail parties that don't raise a lot of money, then you, you have to sit back and say, okay, is this really worth it? Um, but it can be a good way to keep, give your junior staff, your junior development staff, a responsibility. But also, if you can transition it into the junior board really running themselves and just touching base, then that can be a really great way for them to develop leadership skills. That's such a great point. I think a lot of organizations listening might now might be thinking, you know, so much of this sounds great. We definitely want to do all this, but where do we find the time? How do we prioritize what we can really take on? 
as a leadership team or as the few folks, you know, tasked with keeping our board in line and growing our board. Um, and we are at a couple minutes past 10. Um, I'm sure Barbara could actually give us some great tips about prioritization, but I also want to just um, let everyone know who's on. I think we go until 1015. Tommy just confirmed that. So we've got a good 10 minutes for Q&A. Would anyone like to this is kind of risky. Would anyone like to come off mute <laughs> and ask a question of Barbara? <laughs> in your own words or in the chat. I have a question. Chris O'Malley from ISO Arts Council. Great. Thanks, Chris. Hi. So good question. This has really been awesome because with COVID, our board has just been refined, you know, who's effective and who's just not present. So we have decided, and our funding has just dried up, so we're like reinventing ourselves. So the question I have for you is, how do we go about basically rewriting our, um, our bylaws? They don't work anymore. Or should we like just do a COVID amendment to our board? Like, it sounds like we just have to rebuild and we're like the band that went back into the garage or the garage band again, instead of the band. So how do we go about doing that? Is there some place where we can learn how to do that? or get advice. So you mean you, you want to, you mentioned that. revising your bylaws. You want to just, Barbara. you want to change, what? Pardon? We can hear you, Barbara. I think okay. someone forgot to mute. Oh, okay. Uh, so do you mean you want to change the way your board does business? To some extent, because right now we don't have staff. The board is a working board. And some of us are working harder than others and we're all volunteers. We want to get back to the point where we can bring staff back. So it, we're not really in compliance with our bylaws because of that. So it's been an interesting time. Oh God, yes. Um, all right, well, so actually writing, you know, the actual work of rewriting your bylaws, I believe there's a resource on this call, Pro Bono Net, uh, that can help connect you with yep help connect you with uh, law firms that do that that kind of thing pro bono so that's pretty basic in terms of rethinking the way you do business I think there's a you know bunch of us who are consultants who can help out with that um, but you know you're starting at a good place like what what is work think about like write what's down what's working what isn't working and what you need to do that you're not doing and start there Great. i hope that answered the question um, yeah it did. Way, you guys i'm you know you're gonna you're gonna have my contact information so if you have follow-up questions about this please feel free to reach out to me about anything that i said hey christine yes tommy and so I'm actually cutting and pasting just uh, kind of in reference to that question. Um, I think Melissa Greenberger had a sneak out for a 10 o'clock meeting, oh, yeah. but I'm putting her contact info here in the chat as well. Melissa was with us. She's a good friend of our, our community and uh, she's with Pro Bono Partnership. So maybe that'll help you, Chris, um, as well. Uh, um, Chris O'Malley. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah, usually Thanks, when everybody. we're all in the same room and we ask, how many people have benefited from Pro Bono Partnership? Almost every organization has raised their hand because you provide such great assistance, especially if you're looking to do something like revise your bylaws. Um, other questions? If, if I'm not hearing anything, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more because I wanted to ask Barbara, um, back to the prioritization piece. You know, if an organization is just saying, okay, I have very limited capacity, um, in terms of staff time, where our board chair is stretched, where would you say to start with trying to recruit new new board members and re-energize your board and board engagement? I know that's a big one, but yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm <laughs> like Chris O'Malley just mentioned, you know, where it's COVID times, everyone is is under oh. pressure, you know where, if you had to recommend a top three places to start? Um, where? Start looking or start thinking about it? Well, I think the thinking about it has to come first, right? Right, exactly, exactly. Again, think about, first off, think about what's working for you and what's not and, and what you need. And I think, you know, the priority 
for me would be focus on your current board before you go out and it's really easy to just say okay everybody stretch we'll fix this we'll find new board members but if your board current board isn't i won't won't say solid you know every board has challenges but really sort of think through are people currently showing up if not are they do they currently feel like they're passionate and dedicated to the organization um do they um you know I think start there and then think about what do we expect of our board members and if it's a lot, think of that through. And then in terms of actually recruiting new board members, the best thing you could do that takes absolutely no time is put it up on your Facebook page and your LinkedIn page. Right, so, oh, and sign up for my board matching site, of course. I was going to say, are you going to plug that? It's, <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, match uh, come for board members. Yeah. Governance it's, matters. If you haven't posted, if you're looking, it's such a great hub where board members go if someone's looking to serve. Yep. And, and could, if, if, I, if I could also uh, ask for something from this, this group. So we are launching this new site. Uh, on in January for uh, what we really we're not worried so much about organizations signing up. We want to make sure that we attract a good, you know, individuals. So those of you who work for who are board members who work for companies where you would encourage your employees to join nonprofit boards as part of their, you know, your organ, your company's service to the community, etc. If you would let me know and we can talk about how we might get the word out throughout your company uh, that this exists for your employees who want to join boards, I think that would be very, it would be really, really, really helpful. That's great. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of folks that are listening have different connections and would be happy to do that. So we, we'll send a reminder out about that, Barbara, in our follow up. That's great. Um, because it's like you said, you know, so many great professionals don't think of themselves as a potential board member. You know, they might be giving back in different ways or doing some volunteer work on the side for a cause that's close to their heart, but then they don't consider taking that next step. And um, by connecting in different ways, I just asked a colleague who runs an accounting firm, are any of your junior staff thinking of giving back in a new way? Because I have a great opportunity that they might, you know, want to be part of. And I, I should have asked this question years ago, but it didn't occur to me to even go to that person. So sometimes hopefully, you know, listening on, in on this webinar, um, maybe those of you out there who are looking for new board members are, are kind of connecting the dots in your head. It's, how, how come I haven't asked that person yet? They could have, right. they probably are, have this new, new member right under their nose. Um, and sometimes that's where people are hiding. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, well, we're a couple minutes to 1015. Um, any last questions from attendees? Did, if somebody was feeling shy and now wants to ask a question, last chance. Yeah, I have a question. Oh. Hi, uh, Betty Vertek here. Um, have you noticed if there's any difference in board members um, as far as expectations um, with like boards who, who are actually like a trade or professional association versus a nonprofit? Because I know they're, they're both nonprofits, but they're different. They're just different, right? One is for charitable and one is for professional development. Um, it, have you seen any difference and any tips on, on to approach their differences? Well, the one big difference is usually the fundraising piece. Trade associations have dues that usually support them. Um, the other big difference is you, you're, for most of them, you're limited to the pool of who you can recruit to be on the board because you want members to be on the board, right? And I think the third thing is, um, is just as much as a charitable board and maybe even more is to make sure that your board understands its governing responsibility and is showing up. And because sometimes people want to join the board because it's prestigious within the industry. And while it is, you know, you want people who are actually doing the work. And then I guess the fourth thing I would say is to be careful with in those instances that your board doesn't grow to be so big that it's really unwieldy. 
because there's the prestige and because everybody wants representation in the lead, you know, all your members in some ways want, want representation in the leadership of the organization. So the, some, you know, some, I'm working with two organizations actually. So because they have constituents from upstate and then Northern region and then, but they also have big organiz, you know, big, uh, big companies that they're representing and smaller that they're representing, you know, they, they try and spread the, the representation in such a way that their board is like 40 people. And that's really hard to manage. It's a big board. So building turnover, pretty strict turnover into that so that if someone uh, represents an in, that's not currently on the board knows that they, they will have a representation on the board in the next round is a way to mitigate against that. Thank you so much, Betty, for the question and Barbara for the great um, response. To, uh, it's important that we, we do focus on other types of nonprofits on these calls as well. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, can everyone give me a virtual round of applause for Barbara? Thank you. We really appreciate your time. Oh, good. I'm so glad. This and I cool. hope that if you didn't know about Governance Matters, you know now, uh, soon to be Board Strong. Is that right, Board Barbara? Strong. And so we'll send a comprehensive um, follow-up email as usual, letting you know some takeaways from this. Um, and a lot of, we'll link to a lot of the resources that we talked about so that um, you have them at your fingertips going forward. Um, thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you, everybody. And again, don't hesitate to reach out to follow up questions. And Tommy, do you want to oh, plug? I did. Name? Before everybody goes, real quick, um, uh, thank you, Barbara and Christine. Heck of a job. Really appreciate it. Great insight. Thank you for both being here and thanks for doing what you do. Um, Frank Orzo, if you just want to bring us home real quick on a comment, introduce yourself quick and uh, a comment on the nonprofit resource hub. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Frank Orzo, uh, along with Christine Deska, my amazing partner. I'm co founder of Nonprofit Sector Strategies and the developer of the Bells Board Board Management Portal. I'm also Chairman Emeritus of Holy Cross High School. Uh, the thing we want to mention about the Nonprofit Resource Hub, uh, we are looking to uh, have more nonprofit organizations join the hub. It's free to join, and we are having a raffle. Breaking news. We are giving, oh, we yeah. have a raffle. What? Breaking news. We are having a raffle. Any nonprofit organization that joins the Nonprofit Resource Hub between now and December 31st will be entered in a raffle and we're giving away five, that's five $200 awards. Free, no, no, nobody's, no tax, just we're gonna give you money. So join the nonprofit, <laughs> no cost to join. We'd love to have you as part of our great new organization. Nonprofit Resource Hub, Tommy has put the link it is in the, the yes. chat window to join, sign up and get that money. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Frank. That, those are my favorite words. That's what I get told every day when I come up here to the attic. Go get that money. So, <laughs> so thank you, Frank. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you all for being part of this community. It is a special time of the month for, for us when we all get together. So I appreciate you all. If you haven't connected with us before, welcome. If you have connected with us before, just keep staying in touch. Uh, Christine and I will be sharing our next upcoming December event, uh, I would say within the next 48 hours. And uh, if you have feedback, you want to just let us know topics that might be of interest to you. And I know we're going a bit long, so I apologize. If you have topics that might be of interest to you, things that you want to hear more about, connect with us uh, offline and we'll take care of that. But that's, uh, that's our meeting. So thanks very much for being here. And we did record the show, so I'll share it as, as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great holidays, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Alone with your masks on. Ha, 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 ha.